What if Ash Ketchum woke up on time on the day he picked his starter? What if he'd had his first choice and not been forced to take Pikachu? Well, in the first two parts of this ongoing series, I attempted to answer those questions for the Kanto and Johto portions of his journey. If you haven't seen those videos, then you should probably watch them first. They'll be linked down in the description. Today, we're moving on to Hoenn to see just how the lessons he's learned will help him on his way. As we established in the last part, Ash has left the bulk of his Pokemon back in Pallet Town with Professor Oak. When he arrives in Little Root Town, Blastoise is the only Pokemon he has on hand. In the alternate timeline, Ash's Pikachu is sick from an encounter with Team Rocket when he arrives in Hoenn. That's not the case here, so he heads straight to the Pokemon Lab for a meeting with Professor Birch. May is there when he arrives, and thanks to the lack of Pikachu and Team Rocket, her bike hasn't been electrocuted. When Birch shows off the Hoenn starters to Ash, the Pokemon protagonist genius is truly on show. Draco! So is it a water type? No, Ash. Yep, that seems about right. May decides to start her journey with Torchic, and even though her bike is fine, she wants Ash to accompany her, so they set off to Old Ale Town together. Nothing of much importance happens there, so we can jump right ahead to Petalburg City. That's where Ash meets May's brother Max, and her father Norman, the gym leader. As Ash only has one Pokemon in his party, he can't have an official gym battle just yet. Norman offers to battle him anyway in a one-on-one -on -one with no badge on the line. Ash sends out his Blastoise, Norman chooses Vigoroth, and to Max's horror, after a close-fought battle, the water starter gets the win. Norman is briefly shaken after the loss, but he recovers quickly to congratulate his young opponent. Ash will need three Pokemon before he can challenge the Petalburg Gym officially though, so for now, it's time to head off. May and Max decide to tag along, so we've got a trio of travelers leaving the city. When they reach Petalburg Woods and take a lunch break, the lack of Team Rocket comes into play once more. In the original timeline, Jesse and James steal the prepared lunch, so Max gets out some chocolate which attracts a Talo. Without the flying type there to steal Max's chocolate, there's no encounter for Ash, so no Talo today. At this point, Brock catches up with Ash, deciding to join him for another journey. Leaving all of his rock type Pokemon back at the Pewter Gym, Brock has only brought along Psyduck with him to Hoenn. As they're not present in this timeline, Team Rocket also don't steal Brock's sandwiches. Yummy sandwiches! Wow, someone isn't too familiar with Japanese cuisine. Those are quite clearly jelly-filled donuts. Anyway, all of this means that Ash never battles and catches a Talo, so that's going to mix things up going forward. The other original Petalburg Woods encounter plays out virtually identically though. It's a tale as old as time, really. Boy meets Wood Gecko, Boy helps Wood Gecko's futile attempt to save a dying tree, Dying tree... um, dies. Boy battles Wood Gecko with giant weaponized turtle, Boy catches Wood Gecko, as old as time. Obviously, in the original timeline, it's Pikachu instead of Blastoise, but other than that, it's all the same. Ash has a second team member, but he's not done just yet. In Rinshin Town, just outside of Petalburg Woods, Ash and Max befriend a Shroomish. Assuming he'll need three Pokemon in his first gym battle, Ash decides to catch the grass type to take his team up to three. En route to Rustboro City, Ash, Brock, May, and Max stop to go swimming in a lake. While they're there, Brock catches a Lotad, which doesn't really affect Ash, but it might at some point. Also, having seen a Beautifly in action, May's determined to have one for herself, so just outside the city, she catches a Wurmple. After that, the group reaches Rustboro, where Ash will have his first official Hoenn gym battle. It's only now that May reveals to the others that she doesn't want to be a Pokemon trainer. Instead, she's decided to become a Pokemon coordinator and compete in contests across the region. That's fine. Two gym battles in every city may have been a bit much. Anyway, let's get to the Rustboro City Gym. Having learned from his mistakes at the Silver Conference, Ash is keen to develop all of his Pokemon instead of focusing on a select few. So, when he learns it'll be a two-on-two -two battle, he chooses to use Trico and Shroomish. Roxanne is the gym leader in Rustboro, and she starts off the battle with her Geodude. Ash begins with Trico, and this just plays out exactly as it did in the original timeline. Even though Trico should have a massive advantage here, it doesn't know any Grass-type moves, so a Mega Punch from Geodude gives Roxanne the lead. Trico did at least get a couple of good hits in, so Shroomish is able to tie things up with a Mega Drain. When Roxanne sends out her Nose Pass, Ash calls for a Stun Spore, and Shroomish pulls it off to paralyze the Rock type. Then, with its movement limited, Nose Pass can't avoid a Leech Seed. Roxanne's Ace hits hard, so it's a tough battle, but Mega Drain and Leech Seed keep Shroomish healthy, and eventually it becomes too much for Nose Pass. After a stellar performance from Shroomish, Ash has earned the Stone Badge, his first in the Hoenn region. Good stuff! Moving on from Rustboro, Ash, Brock, May, and Max hitch a ride to Duford Island with Mr. Briny and Pico. There's not a lot going on around Duford Town right now, so we can go straight to the gym. 
Brawly's in charge there, and when he leads off with his Machop, Ash sends out Trico again. This time around, only having normal type attacks isn't as much of an issue. Trico redeems itself from the loss against Roxanne, knocking out Machop with a quick attack. It took a lot out of Trico to get there though, so Makuhita doesn't take long to even up the match. As Shroomish put in so much work in Rustboro, Ash decides to give Blastoise his first taste of a Hoenn Gym battle. Makuhita is taken to its limit in no time, but determined to do its best for Brawly, it evolves into Hariyama. That somewhat levels the playing field, but Blastoise has the upper hand from the early damage. Eventually, Hydro Pump washes away Hariyama to earn Ash the Knuckle Badge, and that's going to mix things up a lot. As Ash has defeated Brawly on his first try, he leaves for Slateport early, meaning he never catches Corefish, Brock never catches Mudkip, and Maze Wurmple doesn't evolve twice. We've already gone quite far off course here. When our group reaches Slateport City, May signs up for the local contest, but it's still a long way away thanks to the early arrival. Not wanting to hang around for so long, Ash decides to move on to Morville City to try for his next gym badge and then return. Brock joins him while Max stays with May to help her prepare for her first contest. On their way to Morville City, Ash and Brock cross paths with Misty, the World Cup winner who's in Hoenn looking to improve on her Silver Conference performance. She's keen to get some revenge after her loss to Ash back in Johto, so asks for a simple one-on-one -on -one face off. Of course, Ash agrees, never wanting to say no to a battle, and sends out his Trico to face Misty's Mudkip. Once again, the lack of a Grass-type move nullifies Trico's type advantage. It's a back-and-forth battle, but Mudslap gives Misty's newest team member a big advantage. Mudkip's able to slam the half-blind Trico with a multitude of tackles, and just like that, Misty has won. Ash tries to hide his disappointment, but the loss hurts him. Misty celebrates with her Mudkip, and after saying her goodbyes to Ash and Brock, gets back on the road. Before they make it to Morville City, Ash teaches Trico to use Bullet Seed. The Grass Starter is furious after the loss, and although it takes some time, it eventually masters the new move. Once Ash and Brock reach Morville City, they stop in at the Pokemon Center and then go straight to the gym. Watson's the leader there, and he tells Ash that it'll be a 3-on-3 three -three battle, so Blastoise, Trico, and Shroomish will all be on show. Voltorb and Trico begin the battle, but even with Quick Attack, the Grass Starter can't keep up with the Electro Ball. Sonic Boom knocks out Trico, so Ash is forced to send out Blastoise as a replacement. Voltor rolls rapidly towards Blastoise as Watson calls for self-destruct, but Hydro Pump sends it flying back to the far wall of the gym, making it an almost pointless sacrifice. When Magnemite replaces Voltorb, it starts out with a Swift. Blastoise then misses with a Hydro Pump before a Thunder Wave leaves him paralyzed. Looking to avoid any big hits, Ash calls for Dig, so Blastoise tunnels underground. When he surfaces, he blasts Magnemite from below, sending it crashing into the ceiling. That leaves Watson with only one. Magneton is up last, but when Ash calls for another dig, Blastoise can't move. That allows Magneton to fire a zap cannon barreling into the motionless water type, tying up the match once more. Shroomish enters the battle last, and starts by going for a leech seed. The attack lands, tying up Magneton, but it doesn't last long. Metal Sound shreds the vines, allowing Magneton to press on and attack with Spark. Shroomish is blasted back, but recovers in time to counter with a Mega Drain, although it barely seems to affect Magneton. Backed into a corner and weak from the hits, Shroomish glows bright and evolves into a Breloom. Watson ignores the new development and calls for Spark once more. When Magneton closes the distance though, Breloom swings and connects with a powerful Mach Punch. The Inch Perfect attack scores a critical hit, knocking out Magneton to hand Ash a last gasp win. Once he's heaped praise on the newly evolved Breloom, Ash receives his Dynamo Badge from Watson and leaves the gym. After returning to Slateport City, Ash and Brock catch up with May and Max. In their weeks apart, Maze Wurmple has evolved twice, reaching its final stage. The Slateport contest plays out exactly the same as the original timeline. Drew, a trainer May met while the others were in Morville, ends up defeating her in the battle stage, but falling to Robert in the final. May is disappointed, but determined to improve, and more keen than ever to become a Pokemon coordinator. That's it for Slateport City, so it's time to move on to Fall Arbor Town. On their way there, while traveling back through Morville, Ash finds an Electrike near the power plant. Eager to catch new Pokemon for his team, he battles it with Trico, wearing it down enough for the catch. Then, on their way to Fall Harbor, May comes across a Skitty who appears to be ill. After bringing it to an aromatherapy lab called the Greenhouse, May waits for it to return to full health before offering it a place on her team. Skitty decides to join her, so that's another new Pokemon for our group, but again, it's not that important as it pertains to Ash. When they reach Fall Harbor Town, May enters the contest there, and as she did in the original timeline, she wins. Oh. Well, who saw that coming? After that, it's time to move on to Laveridge Town, the location of the next closest gym. When they arrive there, Ash still wants to prove he can make it without Blastoise, so decides to face off against the Fire-type gym leader without his ace. 
Flannery's trio of Slugma, Mag Cargo, and Torkoal actually pick up a narrow win over Trico, Electric, and Breloom, so Ash goes away to do some training. In a double battle where Trico and Electric are facing off against May, Skitty, and Torchic, Trico evolves into a Grovile, learning Leaf Blade in the process. With one of his three powered up, Ash returns to the gym, and that makes the difference. Breloom manages to eliminate Slugma and Mag Cargo, so Ash ends up in a 3 on 1 against Torkoal. Although Breloom and Electric both fall, Grovile scores the knockout to earn Ash the Heat Patch. With that out of the way, the group leave Laveridge Town and head through the Valley of Steel. While they're there, Ash finds a Torkoal being attacked by a number of Steel types. Thinking back to his battles with Flannery, Ash calls for the Torkoal to use Overheat and that takes care of the attackers. Impressed by its power, Ash offers the Fire type a place on his team. Torkoal is overjoyed by the offer and joins up with Ash, so he has five Pokemon now. Alright, honestly, nothing of real value happens to Ash until they return to Petalburg City, so let's run through the couple of things that did happen. Everyone makes it to Verdant Turf Town safely, where May enters a contest, and she wins again. That is her second ribbon. Good work, May. Brock's Lotad then evolves into a Lombre, and... Yeah, uh, that's it. We're back to Petalburg. The situation that greets our group's return is... a little bit messy. Norman! Ugh, it's Mom! I'm going anywhere but here! After Norman's marriage almost falls apart, though, we can get into the gym battle. This one doesn't actually change too much from the original timeline. Breloom replaces Pikachu, managing to defeat Slackoth and badly injure Vigoroth before being knocked out. Torkoal then finishes the job against Norman's Vigoroth before Slacking takes us into a one-on-one. -on -one. Finally, Grovile takes a beating, but Leaf Blade ends up defeating Slacking to earn Ash's fifth gym badge. Slowly but surely, Ash is proving to himself that he can get by without Blastoise. That'll do it for Petalburg, so let's move on. While travelling towards Fortree City, Ash and friends run into Misty once again. Looking to even things up after the loss outside of Morville City, Ash challenges her to a battle. Ash selects Electric, knowing Misty's water-type preference, and she calls on her Garabus. It's a back-and-forth battle, but Garabus seems destined to triumph when Electric suddenly begins to evolve. After the evolution, Mainectric has a second wind and turns things around to get the win. Misty's frustrated by the loss and says a quick farewell before leaving to return to her training. A little further down the road, May is literally kidnapped by a Skarmory. That's not great, or is it? This leads to May meeting a Bulbasaur who ends up joining her team, so not the worst kidnapping ever. In Rubello Town between Morville and Fortree, May enters a contest and loses. Drew wins though, so it's nice for him at least. To cheer her up though, May enters the Crossgate Poke Ringer, which she wins with Beautifly. In the original timeline, Ash won with Swallow, but without any flying types on hand, he can't even enter this time around. James knocked May out originally, but he's not here either, so she picks up the win. Seriously, everything that happens for the time being is about May. After arriving in Fortree City, everyone meets Winona, who... seems to be responsible for May's kidnapping. Ash is told that he has to wait a few days before Winona can battle him, so after learning that she's a flying-type specialist, he asks for a double battle with May. He asks her to use Torchic and Beautifly against his Grovile and Breloom, so he can practice battling with a type disadvantage. After Beautifly is knocked out, Torchic evolves into Combuskin and defeats Breloom with a peck. Grovile still manages to pick up the win, but again, mostly about May. Anyway, after a couple more days of training, Winona's ready to battle, so she invites Ash to the gym. They get things going, and the beginning plays out just like it did in the original timeline. Grovile faces Altaria and uses its exceptional speed and agility to overcome the disadvantage. After taking some damage, Ash decides to switch Grovile for Mainectric when Pelipper sent out. Even though Winona's come up with strategies to deal with electric types, they aren't enough to save her Pelipper. Spark only has to land once to give Mainectric the win and leave Winona with one. The last member of her team is a shiny Swallow, which, yeah, that's pretty cool. A Hyper Beam causes Mainectric's demise, but it also forces Swallow to slow down and recharge. That allows Grovile to enter the battle and strike with Quick Attack, but an Aerial Ace eventually knocks it out too. After taking a couple of gym battles off, Ash is happy to use Blastoise once again. With the damage dealt by both Mainectric and Grovile, Blastoise doesn't even have much work to do. One well-timed Ice Punch flattens Swallow to finish off Winona so Ash can add the Feather Badge to his case. That takes his total to 6, so he's just two away from earning entry to the Evergrand Conference now. Between the cities of Fortree and Mossdeep, nothing significant happens to affect Ash, but there are a few things worth mentioning. In Lily Cove City, May wins another Pokemon contest, taking her ribbon total to 3. Then, because of Team Rocket's absence, Ash and friends completely miss out on all of the Groudon and Kyogre stuff. It plays out a little differently, but doesn't end the world or anything, so we're all good to keep going. On Moss Deep Island, the twin gym leaders, Tate and Liza, are ready to take on Ash. 
As it's a double battle and Pikachu and Swellow aren't here for some Thunder Armor strats, Ash decides to use Grovile and Breloom. In the original timeline, Tate and Liza are somewhat saved when Team Rocket crashed the party while the twins are locked in a heated argument. Without Jesse and James around to interrupt the battle allowing them to refocus though, Ash is able to capitalise on their poor communication skills and pick up an easy win. The mind badge makes 7, so let's move on. Next up, Mei wins the Purika contest. Her whole journey really hasn't been changed much by Ash waking up on time. Another incident that translates over is Brock's Lombre stealing a water stone and evolving into a Ludicolo. Sadly, in this episode focusing on Mawile, Ash can't catch one for himself, which is honestly just heartbreaking. Instead, he'll have to settle for a snow runt filling out his team. This goes down just like it did in the original timeline. Well, Team Rocket don't come into play, but that doesn't really change anything. Snow Runt still wants to join Ash, so he's got a full team of six. Finally. Now that that's out of the way, let's get into the final Ho and Jim battle. In Sutopolis City, Ash takes on one, and it's a five on five battle, but with a little twist. To get things started, they have a double battle, and although the challenger can make changes, the gym leader can only use his chosen two. Once they're defeated, we move into one on one battles. This will be the final proof that Ash can get by without his starter. A five on five battle against the region's strongest gym leader. If Ash can succeed here without his Blastoise, then maybe he's truly ready for the Pokemon League. Ash starts the battle with Maynectric and the newly caught Snowrunt facing off against Juan Celio and Sea King. With almost no prior training, Snowrunt is quickly defeated, but when Breloom comes in to replace him, Celio and Sea King are both wiped out. The battle then changes format, with Ash taking a lead into the 1v1 portion. Grovile starts things off against Love Disk, but when a Sweet Kiss paralyzes the Grass type, it's too much to overcome. Wan's Love Disk knocks off Grovile with a water gun to tie things up. Breloom returns to battle and saps the last of Love Disk's health with a Mega Drain, and then when Whiskash enters, he repeats the attack. Whiskash goes down in one while simultaneously healing up Breloom, so when Wan sends out Milotic, things aren't looking good for him. Milotic knows recover though, so the back and forth with Breloom features plenty of healing. Eventually, Milotic scores the knockout, but Breloom has done an incredible job. Ash sends out Torkoal next to see what the fire type can do, but the answer is... Not a lot. That leaves only Maynectric. It's a tough battle with Milotic healing up whenever Maynectric seems to get the upper hand. Worn out from the double battle and struggling to dodge Milotic's attacks, the electric dog breaks out thunder for the first time. The jolt from above strikes true, zapping Milotic and sending shockwaves rippling through the gym. Juan is defeated. The rain badge fills the final slot in Ash's case, and with that, he's officially qualified for the Evergrande Conference. There are a few things to clear up before skipping to Evergrande City though, so let's run through those. In Pacific Log Town, Mei enters the local Pokemon contest and wins her fifth ribbon, qualifying her for the Hoenn Grand Festival. Also, on the way back to Slateport, she adds a Munchlax to her team. I know I've said this before, but this series concept has not affected Mei in the slightest. What else? Oh, Ash meets a guy named Morrison who's also aiming to compete in the Evergrande Conference, and they have a battle which Ash wins with Blastoise. Then, back in Slateport, Mei competes in the Grand Festival, but falls at the quarterfinal stage to Drew. In the original timeline, Snow Red devolves during the Grand Festival in a battle with Team Rocket, but as they're off in another region, he's staying unevolved for now. That's the last thing really, so let's skip ahead to Evergrande City. By the time Ash, Brock, Mei, and Max arrive in town, there are plenty of trainers milling around. They meet another conference competitor in Tyson, whose main Pokemon is... Um, my notes just say Puss in Boots from Shrek 2. I'm not sure that's right. We'll figure it out later. Anyway, they go for a meal with Tyson, and when he gets talking to Mei about food, she just completely loses her mind. Well, yeah, there's this burrito made out of peanut butter and cactus that I'd love to try. I'm not sure any piece of film or television or media or anything has ever made me as viscerally uncomfortable as that. Anyway, moving swiftly on. Ash registered for the Pokemon League, and then in a call with Professor Oak decides that he'll only be using the Pokemon he has on hand. This team has done him well, and they deserve the opportunity to go all the way. In a practice battle before the tournament begins, Snowrunt evolves into Glalie, so now five of Ash's six team members are fully evolved. After that, the tournament gets underway. Ash faces off against a trainer named Gilbert in the preliminaries, and Blastoise just has too much for Hitmonlee. Using Dig to avoid high jump kicks, Hitmonlee damages itself repeatedly, leading to a nice easy win to start off the Evergrande Conference. The early stages of the tournament proper will see trainers facing off in double battles, and Ash gets his run going with Glalie and Torkoal against Dominic, Swalot, and Tropius. Although it's a much tougher test than the prelims, Tropius can't last long against a barrage of super effective attacks, and once they take it into a 2 on 1, Glalie and Torkoal don't let up. Swalot falls too, meaning Ash progresses, with one more win securing him entry to the victory tournament. 
The last trainer standing in his way is Clark. Against his Charizard and Quilava, Ash calls on Maynectric and Grovile. It starts out a little bit slow for Ash, but once Quick Attack and Thunder combine to wipe out Charizard, it's another fairly simple two-on-one. When Quilava faints, Ash celebrates with his victorious Pokemon, knowing he's made it into the top 32. As he's been watching on in his off time, Ash knows that all of his rivals made it through to the victory tournament too, but he avoids them all in the round of 32 draw. Instead, for the first full battle of the Evergrande Conference, he'll be taking on Katie. They begin on a rock battlefield with Ash's Torkoal going one-on-one -on -one against Katie's Venomoth. After landing a Stun Spore though, she immediately switches out to her Golduck, who's able to pick up the win with a Hydro Pump. That is Katie's strategy through and through. Smart plays, quick switches, always keep things moving. When Ash calls on Maynectric, Katie switches again out to Dugtrio, but Aurora forces a further change to Wolverine. Unable to move cleanly on the rocky terrain, Wolverine's blasted by a spark and then blown away by thunder. Knowing a call for Dugtrio will just result in another roar, Katie sends out her Mistrevis next. Ash wastes no time in calling for thunder, but Katie's one step ahead and tells the ghost type to use Destiny Bond. Mistrevis is wiped out by the powerful blast of electricity, but before Ash can celebrate, Maynectric faints too. The next matchup sees Breloom facing off against Dugtrio, and it could go either way. In the end, Breloom just about edges it with a Mega Drain before Dugtrio can strike with Double Edge. That brings the battle to half time, which means the battlefield can switch up and it becomes a water field. Ash and Katie start with Blastoise and Golduck respectively, and in the second half, the battle really turns in Ash's favour. Once Blastoise eliminates Golduck, Glalie takes care of Venomoth, and there's just not a lot Scizor can do with so much water in play. Katie's final Pokemon can't avoid a Blastoise Hydro Pump, so Ash will be moving on to the round of 16. When Ash goes with Morrison to see the next round of matchups, the two fast friends see they've been drawn against one another. Since meeting before the Evergrande Conference, the two have bonded due to their equally competitive natures. After seeing his next opponent though, Morrison runs off without saying anything and it seems he's having more problems with the draw than Ash. The next day, the battle begins and Morrison seems hesitant to attack. After easily brushing aside Giraffarick, Growlithe and Swampert on the ice field, the battle reaches its halfway point. Ash goes to Morrison and gives him a pep talk so that he'll give his best in the second half. That spurs Morrison on, so Steelix, Gligar and Metang do much better, but it's too little too late. Ash wins the battle with Blastoise, Grovile, and Breloom still standing, meaning he'll be fairly fresh for his quarterfinal matchup. Down to the final eight, the conference organizers make the draw, pitting Ash against Tyson. When the quarterfinal gets going, the beginning plays out just like it did in the original timeline. Ash's Glalie and Tyson's Sceptile start out with an Ice Beam and a Solar Beam respectively, and the two attacks collide, causing an explosion that knocks out both Pokémon. The second face-off of the battle sees Tyson's Shiftry taking on Ash's Torkoal, and again, this is identical to the original timeline. After taking some serious damage, Torkoal connects with a Flamethrower for the win. Hariyama's up next, and yeah, we're still staying on course. Ash's wake-up time really hasn't changed anything yet. Hariyama's Thick Fat makes it easy to close the distance, and a Brick Break crushes Torkoal to tie up the match. Ash calls on Maynectric third, so we're finally leaving the path of the original timeline. When Tyson calls for an arm thrust, Maynectric leaps out of the way and hits Hariyama in the side with a crunching spark. With the damage already sustained from Flamethrower, the attack finishes off Hariyama, taking us into half time. The battlefield switches from grass to rock at the half, and when the battle restarts, Ash selects Blastoise and Tyson calls on Donphan. Tyson tries to nullify Donphan's disadvantage by calling for Sandstorm and then roll out. Blastoise can't see his opponent and gets slammed by Donphan, but Ash eventually calls for Dig to help him avoid the continuing attack. After biding his time underground while the sandstorm dies down, Blastoise surfaces behind Donphan and blasts it with a hydro pump. The super effective attack sends Donphan straight into the inner wall of the stadium, knocking it out to stretch Ash's advantage to two. Tyson sends out Metagross next, and the pseudo-legendary takes advantage of Ash's tiring team. A devastating meteor mash leaves Blastoise weak, and after scoring a hit with hydro pump, Psychic finishes the job. Then Maynectric returns to battle and connects with Thunder before Hyper Beam wipes him out too. When Grovile enters the battle, Metagross is recharging so the Grass-type can freely pepper it with Bullet Seed. Focusing all of its attacks on one spot, Grovile badly weakens Metagross, and when the two come together with a Leaf Blade and Meteor Mash landing simultaneously, both Pokémon faint. That performance from Metagross has pulled Tyson level with only one Pokémon left for each trainer. Meowth and Breloom enter the battle and immediately get to work. Breloom sends a Leech Seed flying towards Meowth, but it slashes through it instantly and pushes forward to strike with Iron Tail. Breloom is forced backwards but counters with a dynamic punch that Meowth manages to dodge. Slash lands for the geared up Meowth as another dynamic punch is easily avoided. 
Aside from a Mega Drain, Breloom struggles to land anything of note. With Meowth in complete control, Ash calls for his Solar Beam as Tyson orders Meowth to close the distance and attack with Slash once more. Before Breloom gets going though, Ash calls an audible and shouts for Dynamic Punch and Meowth's complacency catches it out. Expecting a stationary opponent, Meowth's approach is careless and predictable, allowing Breloom to land a powerful Dynamic Punch right on the cat's jaw. It's not quite enough to take down the determined Meowth, but with confusion setting in, Breloom's firmly in control. Meowth sends an unprompted thunderbolt in Tyson's direction before swinging an iron tail at fresh air. While this is happening, Breloom charges up a solar beam, unleashing the energy right at Meowth, who's finally defeated by the attack. Tyson returns Meowth to its Pokeball, congratulates Ash on a fantastic battle, and raises his arm in victory. With that, Ash is moving on to the semi-final. Now, here's where we run into a little bit of a problem. Ash lost to Tyson in the original timeline, and we never get to see any of the semi-final match. So, I don't know who Tyson faced or what Pokemon they had. I do know Tyson beat them though, so I'm gonna say that Ash did too. Luckily, in this timeline we do know who's waiting across from him in the final. Avoiding the toughest opponents throughout and spurred on by her will to defeat her main rival, the World Cup winner Misty has made it into the top two. The Kanto natives line up on opposite sides of the arena and the crowd goes silent as the battlefield randomly generates two... Ice. Knowing that it will likely be a water type to start, Ash leads off with his Grovile and, as predicted, Misty sends out her Gardos. The battle begins and as Ash calls for a Bullet Seed, Misty goes for Flamethrower. It burns up the incoming attack before Gardos turns its attention to the battlefield. Instead of attacking Grovile, Gardos uses its Flamethrower to get to work melting the ice. Not keen on battling in a pool, Ash calls for a Leaf Blade trying to stop Gardos, but the Water Serpent just absorbs the hit and keeps on burning. Eventually, there's no ice left to stand on and Grovile splashes down into the water. Before Flamethrower can be directed towards the Flailing Grass type, Ash recalls Grovile and sends out May Nectric. It may not be the best swimmer, but an all-water battlefield does offer up some advantages. As May Nectric attempts a spark though, Misty makes a switch out to her Quagsire. The partial ground type soaks up the hit with ease and then sends a mud shot splatting into May Nectric's face. With reduced visibility and limited movement in the water, Magnectric can't get close enough to use Bite, and a second Mudshot earns Misty the first win of the match. Ash calls on Glalie next, who's unaffected by the pool below as he floats above the battlefield. After dodging a few attacks, Glalie connects with an Ice Beam that freezes Quagsire, allowing Glalie to strike a motionless target with Headbutt to level up the match. Misty sends her Gyarados back out next, and without the threat of electric attacks, the Water Flying type is free to cut loose. Glalie and Gyarados exchange attacks with Ice Beam and Flamethrower both connecting, but it's Gyarados who picks up the win. Ash calls on Blastoise next, desperate to get back in front before the break. There are a few icy platforms on the field thanks to Glalie, but Gyarados is definitely more comfortable navigating the battlefield. Still, when Misty calls for Bite, Gyarados is forced to move in close. As it crunches down on Blastoise's arm, he swings a wild ice punch with his free hand, smashing into the side of Gyarados' head for the knockout. Garbus enters the battle next, and this could definitely be a problem. Gliding through the water at an incredible pace, there's just no way Blastoise will be able to keep up here. Ash decides to make the switch out to Torkoal and just see what the fire type can do. Stranded on a small icy platform, Torkoal is about as far outside its comfort zone as is possible. Still, when Ash calls for an overheat, there's no reason not to execute it. It actually makes contact with Garbus, even burning the water type, and leaves the whole arena filled with a billowing cloud of steam. The heat melts all of the ice remaining in the pool, and once Torkoal plops into the water, there's nothing left to do really. A Garbus Hydro Pump blows away Torkoal, so Misty takes a 3-2 lead into the break. When they return from the brief recess, the battlefield randomly generates a water field. That's not ideal. At least this time there are set platforms. The battle gets back underway with Misty's Wolverine taking on Ash's Breloom. It's a pretty even matchup with plenty of super effective attacking options for both sides. Breloom happily leaps between platforms, attacking with Mega Drain and swinging with Dynamic Punches while Misty calls for countering Ice Beams. Eventually, Breloom strikes true with a Dynamic Punch, knocking out Wolverine to take the match back into a tie. Misty sends out her Starmie next, and this one's also fairly even. Breloom has taken on a lot of damage from Wolverine, though. After a single Mega Drain, Starmie Psychic casts Breloom aside to put Misty back in control. Blastoise returns to battle next, and after exchanging a few attacks, Starmie flies through the air for a rapid spin. Blastoise catches it before the contact though, and sinks his teeth down into Starmie for a super effective bite. That's another knockout for Team Ash. Garbus comes back out next, but the burn inflicted by Torkoal has really taken a toll. 
The worm on a string manages to connect once with Psychic after an ice punch, but ultimately the pain of the burn overwhelms Garabus, who faints, leaving Misty with only one. Swampert enters the battle, and right as Ash calls for an ice punch, Misty calls for Bide. Swampert stands still, absorbing an ice punch in a bite before unleashing the stored energy which cuts through the weakened Blastoise easily, leaving us in a one-on-one. -on -one. Grovile re-enters the conference final, still fresh after a short bout with Gyarados, and locks eyes with Swampert. Misty calls for an ice beam and Ash a leaf blade as Grovile darts from platform to platform. Before making it close enough to land the attack, Grovile is clipped by an ice beam which knocks it off balance and into the water. Just as Grovile returns to a floating platform, Swampert's muddy water sends a wave thundering across the battlefield, knocking it back into the pool. Every time Grovile digs deeper, Swampert seems to have an answer. With virtually nothing left in the tank after an ice beam, Grovile, through sheer determination and will, evolves into a Sceptile. When Ash calls for Leaf Blade now, Sceptile's speed is frightening. Ice Beam goes miles wider than Mark, and Muddy Water only serves to obscure Swampert's view. With a wave blocking its sightline to Sceptile, it's not until the last split second that Swampert sees the Leaf Blade slicing down from above. The strike lands across the top of Swampert's head, the force of which shatters the platform on which it stood. Swampert is knocked out, meaning Misty is out of usable Pokemon, and Ash has won. After all of the challenges he's faced, Ash has finally been crowned a champion. By waking up on time on that fateful day, Ash Ketchum has changed the course of his future. Obviously, this is all just me guessing, so make of that what you will. The further we get from that day, the more guesswork that's required, but based on what he'd learned in Kanto and Johto, I think this all made sense. Still, that's not quite the end of this particular story. After the Evergrande Conference closing ceremony ends, Ash and Brock head back to Petalburg City with May and Max to show off the trophy to Norman. They also stop in at Professor Birch's lab and make a few other stops along the way. By the time they return to Kanto and split up so they can return to their respective hometowns, Ash has missed out on meeting Scott and Viridian City. Instead of crossing paths with Ash and inviting him to compete in the Battle Frontier, it's the Evergrande Conference losing finalist that he runs into. Returning home after her disappointing loss, Misty is invited by Scott to take on the Frontier Brains and looking for a new challenge, she accepts. Of course, Ash missing out on the Battle Frontier means that he never catches Apom, but other than that, very little changes for him. Back in Pallet Town, there's a party thrown to celebrate Ash's victory, but there's one notable absence. Gary Oak's only presence is in the form of a postcard sent from Sinnoh. Gary does congratulate Ash, but the message focuses mainly on the fact that Ash only won because Gary decided to stop competing. After discussing it with Oak, Ash sets his sight on Sinnoh next and asks Brock, May, and Max to accompany him. May has decided to attempt a journey of her own through Kanto, though, and Max is headed back home to study under Norman. That leaves only Brock. The former Pewter City gym leader tells Ash that he wouldn't miss it for the world. After the success of his journey through Hoenn, Ash decides to use the same plan for Sinnoh, starting out with only Blastoise. After a tearful goodbye, Ash leaves Sceptile, Breloom, Maynectric, Torkoal, and Glalie with Professor Oak. Then, he leaves Pallet Town behind once again, ready for a new adventure.